you have a comment, it's uh, the best in the blind. Okay. <laughs> All right, then we'll go ahead and, and uh, move on from public comment. We will have public comment again at the end of the meeting, so uh, I'm sure if you, you have some, you can look at that point in time. And uh, this time we'll open up board comment. Uh, Mr. Miller. Thank you. I, I just got one for Wes. Uh, I had to spend more than 15 minutes reading the auditor's report, and my request would be in the future that we would get that maybe the week before that we have to vote on it, than the, than that day when we got it. We, we've already basically made that plan. Okay. Uh, the other question I've got, where do we come up with the value of those water shares? We got it at twenty-two million dollars. Where does that number come from? It's cost, cost basis. Cost basis. How much? How much we spent to purchase the water? Okay, I'm concerned about ordinance two funds, which will be gone at the end of this year. Uh, I'd like to see some numbers as what that what we're going to have to take out of the starting in January of this coming year, right? Yes. The, well, the numbers are built into the to the budget, uh, and you, if you've got the budget numbers, if you don't um, have that, you're welcome to come in and I'll sit down and go through that with you. Okay. Do you, do you, do you have an, any idea what that is off the top? Of your head? Not right off the top of my head, but I've got the numbers uh, in, the, in the file. I can sit down and go through that with you in detail. Okay. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. I got a uh, comment. I read the paper this week or last week after well, after our last meeting and and uh, I just want to make sure that uh, the public understands that uh, the two representatives from Bunkerville are not appointed one is appointed one is elected one's appointed for two years by the county commission and the other one is elected for a four-year term um, with all the stuff that went on the talk that went on last night or last week last meeting I don't know how we got that in the paper, but that is not a fact. The fact is, one elected, one appointed at this time. And then from a skeet, two are elected, and one is appointed. Just wanted to straighten that out. Okay, and then there's also some other facts in there that were backward as well, but you know, they were, it was in an editorial, so uh, the individual wrote the editorial editorial could have well done um, a little better job of, of finding out what the facts were before he wrote it because there was quite a, quite a bunch of other facts there that were not really even close. Any, any other comments? None. Okay, I'm not seeing any other uh, board comments, uh, president's comments. I um, don't really believe we have any tonight. So we're going to go ahead and move on from that, and we will uh, take up the consent agenda. Uh, so I will open up the consent agenda for either discussion. Uh, if there are any items that need to be removed to be individually uh, discussed, now would be the time uh, to ask for those to be removed, and that could also include the audience. Uh, I'll give the board an opportunity first. None from the uh, board. Uh, we will ask the audience if uh, they have any questions or uh, that they need answered individually on these items. They could be brought up uh, separately uh, off the uh, consent agenda. If not, then we'll I'll go ahead and seek a motion for the consent. Mr. Agenda. President, I'll make a motion that we accept the consent agenda as posted. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and. and a second. Um, all in favor, good ready to write down. Okay, that's five in favor. Uh, See none opposed. The motion carries. And we will move on to uh, item number, uh, number five, which is a presentation and discussion of possible action. Uh, Uh, this would uh, include uh, Merv Boyd and uh, Barry Stubbs from Abbey Stubbs and Ford. We'll update uh, the board on their progress on securing water rights and access on the BLM lands within uh, within and near district service area. 
the board may ask questions and give further uh, direction to them. So with that, uh, Barry, I guess we'll have you lead it off. Sure. Good evening. Thanks for um, the time tonight to uh, bring an update to you and uh, also uh, to answer any questions that uh, you may have. Um, attending tonight with me is uh, Merv Boyd, who is uh, an associate with the Abbey Stokes and Ford, and uh, he's our in-house BLM expert in uh, some of their processes and um, their activities and whatnot. Uh, he's so uh, well versed in having uh, spent a lot of time with those good folks over there. So wasn't sure if you'd have any questions. But, uh, just briefly, um, wanted to uh, update you if you're not aware. Um, the application has been filed with BLM to perfect and uh, augment uh, the holdings that the district has in the Gold Butte area. And uh, there were, there are some water rights up there and some access roads and pipeline uh, alignments that uh, some were fine and some needed to be clarified, cleaned up, and uh, some are, were inadvertently at some point in time left out of uh, records and whatnot. So this was a combination uh, cleanup activity and uh, to get everything formulated so that there was no question about your water right sites, your access, and your pipelines, the, your uh, holdings up within that Gold Butte area. Uh, doing this, of course, in light of the possible uh, legislative actions that may come down to get sure that we're all codified in there and everything is uh, uh, squared away in that regard. So the application that was uh, put together, uh, Merv had our lead on that uh, with uh, Aaron Bunker and your engineering folks uh, to sort through many, many years of old records, files, uh, letters and other things from BLM files and from your own files to get clarity on exactly what you had that was squared away and what needed to be addressed and straightened out. And that all came together in an application that was filed um, <clears throat> on September 18th. And it has been uh, receded in by BLM. It's been assigned a serial number, as they do first, and a, a lead for BLM. So it's starting through the process. Um, we do not at this point yet have a schedule or any anticipated time, so we are on it almost daily over there. The offices are very busy, and uh, our job is to help curve that through, and we will assist them in any way that we can uh, to keep the application flowing. The main point was to get the application receded in and over record so that if and when the Gold Butte legislation comes down, you've got a placeholder, you're in there, and everybody understands what your rights are, and so they're validated. And so it was very important to get that in. There was a lot of work put in by your staff and, and your engineers, and um, so we came together with a good application, and uh, I'm sure there's a copy of it available here if everybody wants to read it. But um, it uh, identifies all those issues that I talked about. So, um, are there any uh, questions or comments about any of that? Board, please. And that. And you and I had uh, a conversation regarding also uh, potential additional uh, funding for the basin study. And, and I thought maybe you could relay your thoughts and observations on that, and I can follow up with what Link and I talked about, if you'd like, afterwards, whenever the board's ready to hear that, if, if they want to move on. Uh, I just, not real familiar with the process, but they receded the, our, our um, application, and at what time do they grant it? I mean, does that come at a later date, or? Yeah, the, the, we, we knew that would be a question, and, and honestly, under the best uh, circumstances, probably 180 days, because this, um, w what we've asked for, for new access roads, new pipeline, is in uh, an existing area-critical environmental concern, right. and, and 
partly uh, in the Virgin Peak um, incident study area for wilderness. There's going to be some additional negotiation. So that's why Barry's we we haven't gotten a timeline from BLM. We're going to you know we'll press them to get this to the top of their list and and help them through the decision process. But as Barry said, the the you know two interests. One is make sure those rights are identified and the needs are identified for legislation so that we're not at the last minute trying to uh, um, gather information about what's needed. Now BLM will need to address that prior to any le legislation, whether it's um, you know by right away, by excluding roads from the NCA in some method they'll need to address that. So I wish I could give you, you know, a drop dead date, um, but um, we expect at least 180 days. Um, and um, do you expect that they'll take the application in its entirety, or do you think they'll come back and say there, there parts of it will be? I think there may there may be some, uh, you know, and that's what why Ken and Aaron and the engineering. We we spent a lot of time on the alignment of the pipelines. Mm -hmm. We've tried to maximize the use of existing roads, both to cut down on the re on the review, and to save the district money for tortoise fees and other things. But in some cases, we're we're going out of the alignment of existing roads because to do otherwise would require new power and, and a lot of other expense. So there's going to be some back and forth with BLM about where the where the new alignment is, where there's new disturbance. Mm -hmm. But I think we, we've got a good uh, we've got good rationale for for asking what we ask for. So I think it'll survive pretty much as uh, you know as uh, as designed. But uh, we'll we'll be, there'll be some arm wrestling. Uh, I think as well. Yeah. Um, actually, I think we stuck to existing roads, but some were not designated. Right. Right. Uh, we didn't. Uh, we didn't try and carve any new alignments. It's just that they weren't yet designated. You're right. I, I, I desi yeah, designated and existing roads, and yeah. then are in their travel plan. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So just and, a, the, and subtle, the, but it's yeah, it's a it's an important distinction. I I appreciate that. And <laughs> and the, because we need 50 feet for the right of way and and the most of the most existing road what we're going to get from BLM is about 12 feet so there's some additional disturbance there did the application include our ability to access the water as far as nickel creek right. the, yeah all right. yeah all right Those are my questions you're a good job <laughs> <laughs> Any board members with any questions? Okay, um, Ken, uh, to Ken's point, um, uh, Ken asked us to take a look, and we did in coordination with Link at um, this funding for your basin study, uh, where you've got with USGS now a 50 50 share, and um, looking to see if there was some way, some avenue that could open up some funds from some other source, federal source. Um, we've looked and uh, as you're probably aware, things are very, very tight in every agency federal budget. And there just is no extra money lying around anywhere that we could identify and I think Link came to the same conclusion. However, um, there is some talk that the new Congress that will uh, convene in January um, may revisit this idea of the earmark prohibition that the House now has in place. And if that happens, then Senator Reed's office has been very really good in uh, helping address some of these issues and as the writers on the legislation and another thing. And they could, uh, in some fashion, maybe amend the funding through USGS or some other federal agency to address uh, additional share from the federal agencies and so forth. But, um, you know, it looks like your best uh, bet and decision might be to hold that decision until after January and let's see how all of that fetters out. Um, we could then, have Kenyon call Senator Reed. He had a picture with him. And <laughs> he put on there to Kenny. He called him Kenny, so I think they're pretty tired. I was just going to say that. He was back there talking to him all, so he's on a first name basis. We could have Kenny call him. Uh, right. If, uh, <laughs> Yeah. And I know he would cooperate. 
as with the others from the delegation. Yeah. <laughs> and it could even be a, uh, a joint effort um, from uh, some Utah and some Arizona folks. Uh, yeah, on those, on those lines, did we ever find out if St. George had filed the application or what the application was? Remember in our last meeting about that, we talked about the fact that St. George had filed, we thought they'd filed applications on that basin when the uh, state engineer was here. But he said they have some existing applications, and it's interesting we found a, an agreement with them dating back about 1993 or so, but no follow up from it, saying that basically we ought to have a basin study done. Um, it's um, it seems from our conversations with them that there it's unlikely that we'll get additional funding from them. As far as they're concerned, the Beaver Dam wash study, which covers Utah's part of the basin, is good for them. So if we want but, to... But the problem is, that, uh, Jason King stated that for them to export water from that basin to another basin, they're going to have to have us sign off on it. True. So that was... I don't know that if that's was, true. I don't that know that, that is true. true. He said it was federal law. <coughs> But he said that was the same thing they were going through in the uh, Snake, Snake Valley. Yeah. Uh, that's what it's called, Wade. Wade would probably know and stuff closer to him. But anyway, he said that was the case. And I thought at that time we had directed staff to find out if they had filed any kind of um, paperwork as far as trying to access that water. We they have permits, but I'll, I'll check on whether or not they request an export permit. Right. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Mr. Stubbs. It's okay. Uh, okay. Um, we'll keep you advised and informed in regular contact with um, with Ken and Aaron. And so, as soon as there's any breaking news, we'll bring it. But one. Uh, the yeah. The yeah, David Baldwin. My question is about the BLM application. If this, uh, if uh, President Obama signs the monument designation, does this application have any influence on protecting those right of ways? It, it's something the BLM would need to resolve. Um, <clears throat> typically, the monument will allow will will allow time to process existing applications. It's not the first time, you know, the monuments have been created, and. Again, it could be by excluding routes from the monument. It could be by approving rights of ways. But um, you know, the, the the fact is, the district has expressed the need that you know it's been accepted by the BLM. So it it will be addressed in some fashion. But it has to be addressed. Yes. It's a requirement that it's yes. addressed. Okay. And that was partially our motive behind trying to speed this. Yeah, I'm just exactly. asking. Exactly. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Stubbs. And, Has uh, the application been recorded in the Federal Register yet? It, it doesn't um, go in the Federal Register. Rights of ways are not required to be published in the Federal Register well, applications. Is it like an environmental assessment? Where there there will be comment? an environmental assessment with public comment, and that's probably your, your interest is public review of the environmental process. Yeah. And that comes after the 180 days? It, well, it, it, it comes, um, BLM will will do their internal process and then they'll publish a draft environmental assessment for comment. And that'll be, you know, the normal notification process. And federal register? Not federal register, not, not federal for, register. An, not for oh, okay. a right away okay. environmental assessment. Oh, well, thank you. But it'll be on their website, it's through their uh -huh. their NEPA process, their okay. uh, e-planning they call it, and uh -huh. they have a register online, yep. um, all that, so does that help? Yes, that's, okay. that's great. Thank you, Peter. Thank, Thank you. you very much, y'all. Uh, <coughs> there need to be action on this, because... Uh, unless you have directions, uh, additional directions uh, to our consultants. I know the direction I give them. Yeah. Keep on, your, you keep, on, keep on, keep on, keep on, on it. We'll do that. Keep on trucking. Thank you. All. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, we'll uh, go ahead and move on to number six, and we have uh, we have Chief Higley here from uh, the Pete Fire Department, and looks uh, like we have John here as well. Um, yeah, glasses off now. 
John from uh, the city of Mosquito Well, and they're here to talk to us about a program uh, uh, regarding maintenance and and uh, the painting of fire hydrants and how maybe we may be able to use the Boy Scouts of America and so to aid us in that. So I'll go ahead and I don't know who, who uh, Chief Higley, are you going to present this? Can we get come up the camera? Uh, I, I think that would be great, Chief Higley, if you could. Uh, I might open it up just to see the way and sure. hopefully you'll. Uh, we've, we've had good conversations. I appreciate uh, seeing Manager Bart being here also. Is, uh, we, we tallied up all the hydrants, and uh, it's actually surprising to us. We have about 650 we own, about 450 in HOAs, another 1250 or so on commercial properties. So of all those hydrants, only about 650 do we actually own and have to maintain. So um, as you may have noticed, uh, up on Riverside, we, we recently recoded hydrants to see how far a gallon of paint will go and uh, to see how see the difference is that I thought we'd start with about a five-year rotation and um, I've spent a lot of time talking with Wes uh, who's talked to the Scoutmaster about um, Eagle Scouts have to do a certain amount of community service as part of earning that uh, badge and that this was currently an Eagle Scout activity was previously an Eagle Scout activity uh, if we provide uh, training and a paint then that could be their community service but then I also, and I was talking with Chief Higley, who, who has been an enthusiastic uh, communicator on this, um, is that maybe uh, in the desert, red paint fades fast. Maybe we could go to yellow, which is equally bright. And then also the idea came up about possibly decorating them. And he said, so long as they're not obscene or camouflaged, he can find them. Um, and then also Wes came up with the idea of maybe we can paint some of them in Bulldog colors, you know. So maybe I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think we want to get uh, a, a program going so that we do take care of the hydrants. And if somebody's willing to provide a lot of the work, where we just provide the paint and standards and a little bit of training, as long as it's um, Chief Higley's okay with the end result, then I think that's good for us, and we should put that program in place. So good with me, Mr. Higley. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're excited to be involved in this and to support Mr. Rock in the presentation. I've come from a community where we adopted hydrants and allowed uh, neighbors to, where they had a fire hydrant in the yard, to, <coughs> to maintain that hydrant, to paint it, and, and do some really fun things with it. We've seen look like Dalmatians to barber poles to just about everything you can think of. We have seen some, uh, I've seen uh, uh, pictures of some that have been kind of well, inappropriate for a, a public setting, and that's why we've asked that they be uh, G-rated, if you will, that they be age-appropriate, that, that any elementary child going by would just have fun with the hydrant. Uh, we do not want any that are painted to, to blend in with their environment so that we have a hard time recognizing them or seeing them. We, we do all we can as far as uh, marking them in the streets and trying to locate them on maps and so forth, but it just makes it easier when they stand out. And we support Ken's uh, suggestion that we change the color. This is not a community where we are worried about color representing the number of GPM per hydrant, those, those types of things. Then. So a, a yellow hydrant makes no difference to us, whether it's yellow or, or red or purple or green, as long as it doesn't blend in with the, its natural surroundings. So whatever the, the water district wants to do with this, we will support 100%. We will give guidance as far as people not pouring paint down the stem where the stem becomes inoperable and we can damage the hydrants, those types of things. But I know even people from the arts community have wanted to paint their hydrants around the, the arts center here in town and, and do those kinds of things. And we're anxious and excited to see those types of things happen in the community. It's just, it's just a fun way for people to be involved with their fire hydrants. With this program, are you looking just at the 650 that we own? Or, I mean, we don't own the rest of them. Right. Uh, as part of our distribution system, I think that um, if the city's okay with decorating them in any fashion that's consistent with the standards, that would be good. And we'd be happy to show people how to correctly prep and paint them. But I think that from our obligation, we just have to provide the coatings and the instructions for the 600. 
and 50 or so that, that we own. Uh, again, if somebody knocks over their hydrant or a line breaks, we go out there and we shut it off. Right? But um, the actual maintenance is not ours. Hi, um, is it, it's, so it's our idea to change them from red to something else. Yes, I'm just I'm throwing it out there. Uh, you know, I hate to sound like a stick in the mud, but I think we create a whole bunch of work for us and for staff if we decide to, to let people paint them, because then we're going to have to prove it, and then there's going to have to be some kind of standard. I, I, I'm all for Eagle Scouts doing it for a project and helping them paint it to a certain standard, but I, I just think we're creating a nightmare if we start letting people paint their hydrants different colors and opening it up. I mean, who's going to who's gonna oversee that? Who's going to approve the hydrant design, the board? Are we going to have the general manager? I mean, 650 hydrants. I, I think we if we change it to yellow, fine. If we're keeping it red, fine. If we're allowing the scouts to do it for, for an Eagle Scout project, fine. But if we're going to start having people come in and create designs and have them approved, and we're just over bunker, but we just let the dogs do their thing, <laughs> leave it at that. So, so they're yellow already. <laughs> yeah. um, red. I, I, I thought that that might become a little bit of a uh, <coughs> more program than we wish to undertake, and that's why I thought that maybe just providing the alternative of uh, a bulldog color set. You know, it's green with. Uh, yellow operating nuts or something like or white operating nuts, I'm sorry. I almost got the bulldog color down. Uh, that might be acceptable if somebody wanted to decorate that way in certain areas. But, you know, again, I'm high school, so I'm not getting near and dear to my heart. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's what it's an open discussion for. One of the things, Ken, is that uh, I don't know how many was it, four or five hundred were owned by homeowners <coughs> associations. I think we need to give them direction on what color, you know, if we're going to have a standard color, I think they need, they'll want direction and, you know, uh, I don't think that, uh, they, they're probably not going to start painting in different colors and, and decorating them unless they've got a consensus of their, of their homeowners to do so, so we can't really justify them doing that, but I think we do, I think we're obligated to let them know what color is the standard color we want. So I, in a way, I, as much as I know what, what it, it sounds good to have all these different ones, I kind of agree with you. I, Was that painful? Yeah, yeah. I see some. <laughs> it, it is kind of painful, but you know, as far as having the scouts do them, I, I would be 100% you know, in favor of that. Um, I think red's fine, and I've seen yellow fades in the desert just as fast as the red does, because I've seen mm -hmm. areas where they paint them so I don't think whichever color we, we want to do. The only problem with that if we go if we go yellow or something, and then are we going to go to the homeowners association and say, well, your new color has to be yellow? Well, downtown, I don't know if the, the uh, yeah, we can maybe do it here, by here. Downtown zone. is is, is uh, if it's yellow, it's it's uh, it's not private. If it's red, it's private. Well, uh, that way we can distinguish <coughs> as we go out and test hydrants. Which which ones we're testing and and uh, downtown Las flowing. Vegas. What's that? Downtown Las Vegas. Downtown Las Vegas. Clark County. <laughs> <laughs> well, now wait a minute. You're saying if it's a private one, you guys don't test it, we right? Don't, we don't. Test it. We we do. It depend. We do go in and flow them and make sure that they're operating. We don't have to, but we usually do. Um, but as far as maintaining them, that's the. HOAs. HOAs or the commercial company's responsibility, um, but we go, we're doing it right now, we go and flow every hydrant in our area and, and grease the fittings and, and uh, we don't paint them. They're, once again, the, the private are red and they paint them. And the, um, the public, public ones are yellow and that's how they come. That's it. That's mm -hmm. the, the uh, I guess code when we go in. So. A question then for, for Chief Higley. In the past, the... Uh, Would that help you? Is that... It doesn't make any difference. We're, we're a small community. We know where our HOAs are. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah. In the past, if you the fire department has gone into HOAs and, and, and opened the valves up, is that? We actually don't go in and maintain the ones on, uh, on HOAs. We, they, they're, they're responsible to maintain their own hydrants. In the past, uh, the city had done, so uh, yeah, we, under we, the policy it's now, it's probably not to do it because we don't have anybody to do it with. Mm -hmm. but we do the past that you have, yeah. Yes, sir. But we just need to know, and if, if that's the case, then, then we need to get the HOAs on some kind of a schedule so that they know that it's been so many years that they have to turn all those on and turn them back off to make sure they're all functioning. Most of them are aware of that, yes. Okay, I'm saying we leave them all red then. <laughs> I, uh, I have a quick question. Well, I, uh, just a little off a little bit. Who is responsible for the all the ones in the HOAs? I mean, who yeah, makes they the own, they own. So they can hire anybody they want. And they get a volunteer. It comes like to paint them and test them, and there's no Carl basis as to Carson. how often they need to be tested or anything. Well, one of their houses burned down. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. You're right. Uh, we. Uh, it is up to the HOA to maintain their hydrants. To notify that if the, the water district, if the hydrant is out of service, is there any problem with the hydrant? As we go into the HOAs for official business, if we see a hydrant that has a, an issue that we see, we will make recommendations to the HOA to correct those those issues. Is there any, is there any company in town that, uh, that goes around and does those things? Or? I think they're all outside the city, outside of our community. You know, I know our association just uh, painted all the word red and, and it was done by the association. And yes. They did, it was done by volunteers in our association and they did a great job on them, but they're How many of them were Eagle Scouts? <laughs> None of them were. They were Some were senior scouts. The board yeah. president, the vice president, and the rest, was, veterans. And the rest was left town while they were doing it. So. Oh, on the ownership of the of the hydrants, I'm on the board of the Canyon Crest HOA, and we just did a reserve study and had to count all the, the hydrants in, in the in the HOA to account for them. And I, I wasn't aware; it wasn't ever brought up that we had any maintenance requirement to open those up. I understand painting them, but in, in for example, Canyon Crest, which I'm familiar with, my our understanding is going down like Oasis Boulevard. Since it's a public road, that's not an HOA hydrant, and when you get into other roads, private roads in there, then those are the HOA's hydrants. Uh, is, is that, and, uh, and to put a little bit more detail, I'm assuming like on Oasis Boulevard, the hydrants on that road, then they, they're, they are owned by the water, the, 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 the uh, Virgin Valley Water District, is that who actually owns those, not the city? If it's on a um, public street, if it's on a public street, then the, uh, that the city has utilities on, we have the utilities, we, we own hydrants. Interesting situation is if it's on, in an HOA, but it's a public street, we own the laterals to the hydrants, but not the hydrants themselves. Well, we were told not to include any hydrants on a public street. That's true. Okay, but that contradicts what just what no rock is. on a public street. I'm sorry. If they're inside the HOA and they're public street, then they are. They are not our hydrants. Right. Said. Right. So that's contradictory. So if it's a public street inside the HOA. It's not there are street. a few of those. Yeah. Well, we've got all kinds of them in Canyon Crest. I mean, all of Oasis Boulevard, I, Ivy League up, Ivy League up up there. That's all public road. And our understanding was we didn't have responsibility for those hydrants. That was. Uh, we only have responsibility for hydrants on private roads, like, like Huntington Heights, like uh, uh, you know, like uh, in Spanish Bay and up up in uh, Carrera Drive, up in those areas that off uh, that are private. Those are the ones that we have responsibility for. That's, is that not true? Are those hydrants located on what's considered common area of the HOA, or is it? Well, we we'll see that's that's where it gets. I mean, e even when you go up o Oasis Boulevard, that's private. That's public street, but Canyon Crest handles all the maintenance of that. So, you know, I don't. It's really kind of a gray area of who who's responsible because we have to have the we take care of all the the landscaping maintenance and all that up and down Oasis Boulevard. That's probably in the development agreement. Land 
Yeah. That, that's what's confusing because we like, didn't include any of those hydrants in our. The roads, the roads of the public street. Uh, that's how we designated it. So there, those hydrants on Oasis Boulevard in Ivy League and the public streets, what considered that we don't maintain, that the city comes by and maintains, cleans up, and does that. We didn't count any of those. I don't know the case by case basis, mm -hmm. but um, if you'd like to, I can get back to you with. Well, we the yeah, we're going to have to have some understanding of who's responsible for what, yeah. and uh, and also, Chief, I, I was under the under understanding that, and the water district that they didn't particularly want those valves open because of the problems, that the surge hydraulic problems in the water lines that it can can rupture lines and things by opening and closing those uh, fire hydrants. That's. Is that true, or is that just a... A fire hydrant is properly open and properly closed. It will not cause water hammer. It's when somebody has not been properly instructed, and I actually have some examples in here. If you watch an article on how can we coordinate fire hydrant maintenance better, is that if somebody thinks that you have to slam it shut, then they can blow up the lines right. and cause surges. So you open it gradually, and once you get it going, then you can open it fast, and then you only operate it fully open, otherwise you're gonna damage the seat to the valve. When you close it, do not close it fast, otherwise the water will cause hammer and can blow apart pipes. Let me make a comment, Ken. Please. And, and, and Mr. Baldwin, also that's if you have actually water flow. How we actually do it is we, we open the hydrant without taking the the, uh, the, the caps off, so okay. we get water into the hydrant, but we don't flow You water. don't flow any water. Then we okay. close it, and then, so we just know that it'll open and we hear water flow okay. through the hydrant, right. close it down, and then it drains through its, its, its drain system. So we're not creating a water hammer doing that. And, and we've been trying to be very sensitive with the, the flow of water, yeah. because that stirs all the, all the sand that it collects in our, in our system, and all of a sudden people complaining about the right. water being red, those types okay. of things, we try to minimize that okay. by not flowing water to, to preserve water and conserve water and just to make sure that the valves are, are correctly operating that's that's our concern yeah, okay that that's good good information although we the district may still use those hydrants to flush lines um, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we would need to do that occasionally to have sequential flushing of lines to clean it out and it seems like a waste of water but it's necessary in order to get as chief Higley said sand and other contaminants that might accumulate in slow moving sections. Occasionally you have to create a scouring velocity to flush them out and you have to do it predictably. It takes out rocks that can damage our engines, those kinds of things get by our, our, our filters. Yeah. It takes all that out of there, yes, you're right. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, one more comment is, is if, we were, if we're building an area too, some of those areas, especially like for businesses, require water flows for insurance purposes and we'll go out and conduct those water flow tests. That's about the only time we actually flow water for any cons uh, considerable amount of time. Bob Shankly, on the HMOs, uh, is there a list that you can provide to them of accredited people to do the maintenance and the schedule that that maintenance needs to be done so that they can incorporate it into their HOA plans because anybody can tell you they can test the hydrant, but many of those people are not qualified. How do we know that we have, I know when we have someone from your department, we've got somebody that's certified. What about when you're asking us to go outside? How do we know that these people are certified to do it properly without causing us more problems than it's worth? I don't have any names to you, Chief. Not off the top of my head. I would I would say as you as you contact those people to ask questions, ask them if they are certified, if they are licensed as, you know, what, what kind of licenses they have, what kind of licensure they have. Check with the Better Business Bureau. It is a buyer beware. You know, so it's so, so it pays to do your homework before you contract with anyone to uh, uh, check those hydrants mm -hmm. or maintain those hydrants. I would certainly do my homework first to make sure that they are licensed to know what they're doing, that they, they're bonded in case they cause damage to your water system or whatever. The HOA managing organization, the, the property managers, seems like they would be a nexus that would be able to provide that. Yeah. 
you know, that's what they're supposed to do. By those kinds of ideas and connections and you know, service agreements. I'm gonna go to mine. <laughs> Okay, the Boy Scout thing, we still haven't really uh, talked much about <coughs> actually utilizing them. I don't, know. I don't have a problem with having the Boy Scouts paint the hydrants. I mean, if, if that's what we're I think it's good, yeah. yeah. They don't like paint what cheap labor. 30 a year, roughly. Give a little Boy Scout something to do. If I could just address that, after talking with, uh, I talked with um, Kevin Jensen's actually on the uh, Eagle Board Board of Review, uh, and he's the one that um, was able to give me a little bit of direction on this. He said, you know, some years we have eight or ten Eagle Scout candidates, some years we might have one or two. So it's not, it's not certain that we would have an, enough Scouts in any one year to be able to provide it. Our thought process was, at least as Ken was talking, uh, for those that we're responsible for, we would have a plan in place to um, maintain 130 a year and we would determine these are the 130 that we want to do next year if we have if we have the scouts come to us and say we want to move forward with uh, you know an eagle wants to and a scout wants to take on a project then we would assign him a certain number whatever is appropriate to achieve his obligation in terms of hours and so forth um, and assign them which ones to do and then we would maintain the rest. If we had four or five scouts asking for, um, for projects, then we might be able to accommodate all of that with the scouts in any given year. Um, so we would just flex on a district basis. If they, if they asked for it, we would provide them direction on these are the ones we want, and here's our standard, and somebody to train them to that standard. And I talked to Kevin about the idea that we would do this. We would establish a written standard uh, and a procedure in a way that they're doing it to standards that meet the needs of the department, meet our needs from a water perspective, and are going to look good. Uh, and also is going to be done in a way that's going to meet the obligations of the scouts to accomplish their project, which is, it's a leadership training thing for them. We don't, an Eagle Scout isn't supposed to go out and paint, you know, 130 fire hydrants. His job is to get 20 volunteers to go out and do that, and his job is to supervise and orchestrate that process. That's what's supposed to happen from there, from their perspective. So we think we can orchestrate that on our perspective, but we're not expecting that they would be able to do it all the time. If they ask for it, I think we can handle doing that for them. Okay, good. Okay, what do we do now? Open up the board, where have we lost a board member? The good evening. Get his <laughs> <laughs> the paint is, is just like a pig. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, this uh, really was just for discussion. I don't know, we could make, we could have, I could accept a motion if somebody wants to make it's a motion. A possible action. Uh, yes. It is a possible action. So if we want to, you know, if you want to make a motion or, or somebody else would like to make a motion. I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion that we continue to paint the hydrants red and that we make it available for the Boy Scouts with proper training from the Water District on training on painting and um, general maintenance of the of the hydrant, which may be pulling the, the steamers off, greasing them, putting them back on before they paint them. Just something simple like that. Make sure they're clean around them. Um, but we'll leave that up to staff. But, okay, that's my motion. I'll second it. All right. <clears throat> All in favor? Four in favor, uh, one absent for, from the vote. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> purple now. <laughs> Purple's uh, secondary for uh, poop water downtown. <laughs> you get a purple hydrant, don't you drink it. Sure. Don't drink the water. Huh? Okay. <laughs> Okay, we'll move on to number seven, and, and that's a discussion of possible action. Uh, the board will consider potential renewal of the district's annual $72,000 contract with uh, Furman Group, uh, which is uh, Link Baller. Uh, that's our federal lobbyist, uh, the district's federal lobbyist, and uh, 
term expense or, or current agreement expires, or current agreement expires on 11-5. Uh, so that's why we're reviewing this tomorrow. Yeah, for six months. Yeah, I think that the last time that uh, Link came before us, uh, he had... <coughs> yeah, we didn't do a whole year contract. No, we didn't do it because I think he had that much left from yeah. Yeah, the that's previous right. contract, that's right. if I recall. Yeah, if I might, what happened was the last time we had this conversation, it was during our budget discussions, and we acknowledged the fact that their contract runs out uh, in November, and uh, that the board at that point in time determined to let it run to November at and then make a decision on how you want to proceed. It is budgeted, however, for the $6,000 monthly for fiscal year 2013. Mr. Bowler, we're on uh, number seven there, and we're just talking about the uh, possible renewal of the Furman group. group. Yeah, we've got to start with that. Sure. Okay. I'm still in my American government class, and I've still got it in my head that we have representatives that are elected, and they're the people that are supposed to be speaking for us. I strongly disagree with lobbyists, so I will not be supporting this. Okay. I agree with you on the representatives, but I think sometimes it's nice to have somebody back there that's looking out for our interests. I don't necessarily think that. Uh, all our representatives necessarily uh, know where Mesquite and Bunkerville are, or care where Mesquite and Bunkerville are, for that matter. Um, I think 72000 is a lot of money, but after spending a little time back there with, uh, with the Furman Group and, and being able to walk into those offices and them people didn't know us from Adam, but they surely knew who Link was. And, and he had spent time with each one of them, and they all knew who he was and, and what he was there for and who he was representing. I think that goes a long ways when uh, uh, we have issues like we do right now uh, that needs representation back in D.C. Okay. I'm somewhere between Ted and Ken. <laughs> I hear what you're saying, Ted. I just think right now at this moment we have some issues facing us that we need to make sure we get taken care of. If he, if he can find the money for the study and he can, uh, he can make sure that our interests are protected in this NCA or whatever designation that federal government decides to come up with. But I, I hear what you're saying. I agree. I mean, well, I, need, I think we need to take a long, after this easement stuff's taken care of and after We've got our, we need to take a long, hard look at our lobbyists and see who's pulling the weight and who's pulling our leg and act accordingly. That's good, pulling their leg. <laughs> Sandra, <coughs> some comments? Or? No, not really. I mean, I, I believe the Furman Group has done a lot for us, and I believe that we need them still at this time. You know, we do have lobbyists in several different areas, but I think we need somebody there that, that does know where Mesquite is and where Bunkerville is and what our needs are. Yeah, and I, I think I agree with that. I think it's not just knowing where Bunkerville and Mesquite is, but I think they know where, where uh, the rubber meets the road back in Washington. You know, they can walk into an office and they got a relationship with uh, one of the senators or, or representatives uh, key person and they have his ear, uh, those items <coughs> have an opportunity to be heard otherwise. Uh, thanks for bringing it by and we'll see you later. Uh, and, and I think that we do need to look at these, all of these, but I, I, I agree with both of with, with, well with uh, the three of you that uh, uh, right now we've got some critical issues that need to be resolved. I, I guess one thing that maybe maybe that bugs me just a little bit is if you got a seventy-two thousand dollar contract being renewed, then I think you probably ought to show up to the meeting. Was he 
aware of this? Or? Yes, he was, and he gave me a call today, and he said, is there, uh, is there anything that I need to uh, discuss? And I said, well, it was very helpful, your memo regarding the earmarking and the chance of that possibly being uh, renewed in January with a change of heart in Congress. So um, I appreciate that, but I didn't really have anything else for you. Just make sure these issues don't drop. Is that okay? And he, he was aware that his contract was up for renewal. We were yes. meeting about that. Yeah. <coughs> and he's in Washington D.C. or he's in I think probably he's, he's probably in Vegas right now. Or in he lives actually in Reno. I, I don't know. I, I don't only know. got his mobile home number. I mean, his mobile phone number, which is 202 area code, and I didn't have a chance to call him back. I think Link lives in D.C. Yeah, I think sure. it is. Yeah, he's full yeah. cool time. He okay. has a place in like Reston or something like that. Okay. I know when when we were back there, he was going home to his wife and kids. So yeah, I think it's Virginia. Somewhere close. Okay. If I might just one more. Thing. You know, it, it did good for me to hear what Kenyon had to say about how you were treated and how the representation, representation worked when you were in D.C. I think, I think more people need to hear that, that you got what you needed and that they were there to actually help you and that these people recognized them. But that was a good thing for me. Make a motion. I'll make a motion that we uh, renew uh, our um, annual <coughs> contract with the Furman Group for seventy-two thousand. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and second. Uh, all in favor? Right, raise your right hand. Four in favor. Uh, one opposed. And uh, that item passes. Approved. Uh, <coughs> so we'll move on to item number eight. Which is discussion and before uh, before you get started on this, I'm gonna <coughs> I'm gonna abstain from this. So oh, okay. due to the fact that my family owns a property that the tank sits on. So. Okay, great. Uh, we, can, can we ask you one question? Can we ask you one question? <laughs> <laughs> you can ask me a question. Uh, may not answer. You don't care what the answer is. <laughs> As I recall, when we were going through this, we don't even have a written agreement between you and your dad, or between us and your dad on this property, right? I mean, there's nothing in writing. There's no written agreement between the water district and my dad. Yeah. We're just using that property. Yeah. And it's your it's property. It's a lot more, there's a lot more legally. Yeah, that's there. not, it's a little more complicated yeah. than that. That's a right of way that's existed for a long time and the property. But there's no, there's no paperwork on it. That was granted to be built there. Matter of fact, the, when it was built there, the person who owned the property actually did some construction on it. But that's not the point. The point is, as long as we're using it, we're, what it says, what we're saying is they can use it uh, as long as it's available to use. If it's not available okay. to use, then of course, then they wouldn't be using it anymore. But that would be to pull me either remove the tank or we come to some kind of agreement. Uh, this is just a little tiny tower, isn't it? Yeah. What is it you're referring to, Ted? I'm sorry. The hmm. water tank at Bunkerville, the old concrete water. The, the tower that you got, you're wanting to use for the amateur radio. There is a tower existing there connected to the building that is not a very tall tower. No, it's probably not. But it's already up feet. there, right? It is existing, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right with me. Would there be any functional? Would it work at all? Would it help? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Are you discussing the item relative yeah. to the yeah. use of the? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just Thank asking you. you if it's a low tower and stuff. Is this something that's viable, or are we doing something that's not even viable? Theron Jensen, 988 Chaparral. Uh, it's been used before. There has been a an antenna and a repeater at that site some years past. They removed it and moved it up to Fire Station 2 by the airport and found that they do not get the propagation necessary to accommodate a, a link connection to Las Vegas. So they're looking to come back either at that site or to the Treatment 31. And I know that we've got some other issues there relative to dealing with the city and the county and the BLM. Yeah, that's one we're doing on. Well. 
<coughs> we would like your approval relative to both those sites is what we're asking for. And then we will likely only use one, preferably treatment 31, if we can get the other approvals. If not, we need a fallback position. So that's where we're at. Okay, well, I think the, where we are right now is that we can make a decision on this one tonight. We don't necessarily have to do it, but I, I think it's going to take probably another meeting until we can uh, get to go to the city. There's been a lot going on. Well, what that. we're looking for from you is an approval from you. We are seeking approvals from the city and the county okay. and the BLM. So if you say it's okay, if they say it's okay, okay. that's all we're looking oh, for. Right. We're not going to be, by your say so, we're not going to go construct it. Side up. I mean, I'll go do it because we know there are other parties that are yeah. very involved in that site. It's yeah, it's somewhat complicated too because there's a, a cost sharing formula, and you would have to be worked into that formula. And, yeah, we we would have to be worked into that. It's the just zero a, basis. Yeah, it's just a, a straight percentage. <laughs> it's a straight percentage of whatever the uh, power times it how many times you like, just as long as it's zero. That's right. Yeah, call it multiply, zero, huh? multiply zero by whatever factor you'd like. Do that. We'll send you a bill. <laughs> okay. We won't, but the county will. Well, and we'll deal with the county relative. <coughs> I know there are some issues there, and the county's put a lot of uh, improvements into the site, and it's basically, from what I understand, managing the site. Uh, so yeah, they, we they received dealing. a federal grant, uh, yeah. a communication grant, and yeah. uh, it's all about the generator for all that. We're a, we're a non-profit service, service organization, so we really don't have funds. I mean, that's the honest truth of it. What we'd like to do is just piggyback on the county. If they'll allow us to do that, we'll deal with them relative to those kinds of issues. Well, I'm going to you, uh, step forward then because that really clarifies it a little better. Yeah. So, appreciate it. No, thank you. Is there any other questions about it? No. One other comment. I know at the water tower lane site for the old concrete, uh, Probably six months ago, we actually had the Bunker of Fire Department also ask about that site, and that uh, <coughs> let them know at that time, let Ken know as well, uh, bring it before the board if they wanted to pursue that. As I know there's other people that have been looking at, looking at possibly using that as a repeater for, for communication as well. And we'd be happy to work with them to accommodate the site to their need too. I mean, the, the, those, you can hang half a dozen antennas there typically without any problem. And they don't interfere with each other. The frequencies are such that there's no, no overlap. So, okay, I'm ready to make a motion. Any further discussion? <coughs> motion on. Uh, okay, uh, I make a motion with grant permission for the Mesquite Amateur Radio Club to use existing radio tower facilities at the Bunkerville Area Concrete Water Tank with no assumption of district liability or length or use guaranteed. Yes. Can you, or have you thought about including the 31 in it so they can just pursue No, let's leave 31 alone. Uh -huh. Well, if they go on the one with the, the city and the county that's, that's working there. They're going to be working with the county, it's not. What we're doing on 31 is seeking your approval with the understanding that your approval is not the only approval necessary right. to utilize that site. Right. Just, you're the, you're the base there. You're the ones that have the site. Uh, dealt with the BLM. We're starting at the bottom and working our way up okay. or down, maybe. I don't know which way we're so running. So is that site known as the uh, scenic tank site? Is that what that's commonly referred to as? I'm looking at an agreement that, that Cheryl Hunt and I worked on with the city. And I think the site you're talking about is the what we refer to as the scenic tank site. That's correct. Okay. So that's is that correct? Yes. I, I knew it as treatment plan 31. That's okay. how I kind of had understood it. So, so however you understand it, as long as we know where we're talking, mm -hmm. the site where the treatment plan is with the existing tower that the county utilizes. You're not talking the one up, up my white room? No, no, no. Okay. So no, that's no, where no. Ted's can, no, that's no, 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 okay. no. We wouldn't be asking for that one. We're, okay. We know better. All right. All right. Prior to the treatment yeah. plant being in there, that was just a water tank there, and it was called a scenic okay. water tank. So, so, that's so I'll amend it stems. to include okay. the, the tank on 31? In the, the scenic, yes. whatever yeah. you refer to it as. I would, I would ask, because this is located within a BLM right-of-way, I would just make your motion subject to all approvals being obtained from BLM, the city, and the county. Okay. And, so the motion is amended to include the site 31 uh, with uh, all the BLM restrictions and also Clark County restrictions. 
and we and we will deal with the city, the county, city and the BLM right. as appropriate. All appropriate. Yes. All appropriate. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. I'll second that. Mother in law and everybody. That's the world we live in. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in that favor. Just raise your right hand. That's four in favor. Uh, one absent from this vote. So abstain from this vote. Make sure that, that mother in law gets a lot of the vote carries uh, four, four in favor and one abstain. So it passes. And he's gone. He vanished. Okay. Going home to, he's going home to watch the uh, debate. Okay. We're down to number nine for discussion of possible action after input from the board and uh, research and research uh, by Bobam, Ken Rock, uh, a revised alcohol and substance abuse policy will be offered for discussion of possible adoption uh, as it is or with further changes by the board. So uh, you going to, we have a copy of that? Yeah. That's one we just got before. I can introduce it and most of the intelligence speaking will be from both. Most intelligent speaking of these things. Usually is. Yeah, in fact, you made a comment or what? I'm going to say usually is. Most intelligent. Bo and I did make all revisions uh, that we uh, could to that policy except for one, which is significant. We did not include uh, pre hiring testing for and uh, random drug testing for people who are not in uh, what would be in, in non-safety positions. As Bo's research indicated, that would be legally problematic in Nevada. So um, we did craft uh, a Can strong- Can I ask a question on that? The, the smart answer will come from mm -hmm. I don't understand that. I mean, yeah. we have pri private companies out there that, that require it. We have um, you know, a number of, of uh, Agencies that require it. Uh, I, yeah, it's it's absolutely allowed in certain positions, including safety as well as anything CDL through the federal government and the federal legislation. Define safety. Um, safety positions would be something like heavy equipment, um, something that would involve danger to the public, like a like a situation with a CDL, a commercial driver's license. Well, I guess I can define safety different ways though. Uh, we have people that uh, take care of money that, that's a safety issue for the, the water district and for the community. Um, if they're impaired in any... Um, you know, we just uh, had to let somebody go because of a situation with this. Um, if we had had a program in place with random drug testing, we could have saved a lot of headache and a lot of heartache. Uh, with that situation. Um, I don't know if he had a CDL, but he was in a public safety situation. Um, I think any time that you get in a, uh, a um, water district vehicle is a public safety issue. If you're impaired, if there's any chance, you don't have to have a CDL to drive a water district car. If you do anything, I mean, I think you can open this up, and it should be opened up. That's why when we voted on this to go before, that that's what we re we wanted, was that it was going to be that random drug testing for everybody in the district. Because I think that you can put in there the safety issues, anything. Is, is this coming from PULPAC? Is that pull, pull pack, um Yes, has the same opinion that I ultimately came to. By the way, Kenny, I can I completely agree with everything you're saying. I would love to see a random drug test. I mean, my opinion doesn't matter on that issue. You guys set the policy, but just as a as a resident of the community, I absolutely agree with you, and I think it should be allowed. Based on the legal well, research that we did, this is this is the answer legally. Bo, Bo, I I I actually went over to the city and got a copy of their drug policy because. You know, in, in the memo it says specifically a CDL. That's, that's not entirely correct. It's not a 
But what he said about the safety position, I agree with. That's that's what for safety. And that's what the policy that we safety we wrote sensitive has positions, it. and and the city's the city's actually uh, defines it. Um, and, and going back a little bit, you said no pre-employment testing? Uh, I believe that... No, it has pre-employment testing. Oh, okay. safety. But you said, you said no testing for pre-employment. For non-safety. Right. Uh -huh. No, we, we can test for all pre-employment. Everybody. Yeah, yeah so yeah, we can yeah, also test for, okay. for promotions to new positions as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I concur with all and I think it should be in all that. But um, going, back to, other going back to the safety sensitive position, this is how they define it. Department safety sensitive <coughs> positions mean an employment position to lay, which may in the normal course of business require the employee to operate the cities, this will be say city of course, cities vehicles or heavy equipment on a regular and recurring basis and or involve job duties which if performed with inattentiveness, in, inattentiveness errors in judgment or diminished coordination, dexterity or composure may result in mistakes that could present a real and imminent threat to the personal health and safety of the employee, co-worker, and the, or the public. So yeah, our, our definition in the policy that you guys have yeah. in your packet is very close to the one you read. It doesn't include all vehicles, but it does say require the employee to operate the employer's vehicles or heavy equipment or private vehicle on organizational business on a regular or recurring basis. What's I mean, that, if that's what Kenyon and you guys are referring to, then yes, that would be included, but if it's just a random, somebody goes out and drives a district vehicle one time, I don't think that would open us up to have the ability to test them. And just so I can give some a little bit of background, because I was a little bit surprised by what we found. Um, but we did speak to a number of different entities, SNWA and their attorneys, and, and a whole bunch of people on this uh -huh. issue, uh, so that we weren't reinventing the wheel. <clears throat> this all stems from the Fourth Amendment. Um, the the Right. Water District is a political subdivision of the state of Nevada. And so the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution says there can't be any unreasonable search. And the courts have, have interpreted that to mean that you can't, that search consists of somebody's person, meaning random drug testing, blood tests, those kinds of things. And so the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution says you have to have a, a reasonable basis to do that. There's no unreasonable searches and seizures. So the courts have said, okay, any political subdivision of the state, any s state action uh, requires you to abide by the Constitution. Um, that's why there would be a difference between a private commercial entity and an a entity like the Water District, which were a pol political subdivision of the state of Nevada. So in my, in my opinion, legally, uh, I think if the district were to try to broaden this more than, than what we've presented here, and, and I think this could be slightly adjusted, but if you look at the various policies of big entities around the state, you're going to see language that's almost identical to this. And in fact, it's almost identical to what, uh, to what, what Rich I, read. What I said, the only difference is the city will have a list of positions designated as uh, department safety sensitive. Yeah, we can, and we can do that. I think that would be a good idea to yeah. add that. All field positions, I think. Because the last the thing you want is yeah. Wes to get a crack habit and start. Yeah. And Ben looks exactly. out. You know? Yeah. I'm worried about it. Don't make CFO on, on drugs. He <laughs> <laughs> wasn't even He was high. I'm just trying to figure out how to respond appropriately. <laughs> There isn't a way to respond. No, was, that's why I didn't respond. Start going into convulsions or something. Okay. Kenny, did you look at that uh, safety sensitive positions definition on page three? Does that? I, I read the whole thing and and uh, <clears throat> I mean, the district could take a, a if the district wanted to, it could take a very aggressive approach on defining, you know, inattentive, inattentiveness and errors in judgment. Um, I, I would, from a legal perspective, I'd be a little bit concerned about making that too broad. Um, Anybody that handles money? Yeah, I, I mean, I think they're, they're really talking about a situation where you could bring har physical harm or serious bodily injury to somebody. I think that's what they're referring to rather than a monetary property damage type situation. Although, well, well, let's go back to the, the scenario that I just said about this guy that we let go. 
you know, he didn't bring any bodily harm to anybody. But yet we had to let, go, let him go because he had a drug habit that he was going out and stealing drugs, supposedly, yeah. allegedly, yeah. stealing, breaking into people's houses, stealing drugs. I think any time you're breaking what, and entering, you're probably a safe well, issue. But if I have a drug problem, we just had this down town in the fire department where a guy was going out and making 911 calls and one would leave the station and come in and steal the money out of the chow fund out of the station. Mm. Now we got, and I'm not saying that any of the girls would ever steal any money, but if they have a drug problem and they have access to cash and to personal information that they could get into people's accounts, to me that is that can go right along with, with that problem. Yeah, I think I think Kenyon to address, the way that I would recommend that that issue be addressed would probably be more along the lines of what's in section nine, reasonable suspicion. Anything that would induce an ordinary, prudent, cautious person to believe a person is under the influence of drug or alcohol, was or possession or selling, or cir circumstances which may constitute a basis for determining reasonable suspicion. I think that would be a situation. I think both of those situations you're describing, that if that employee had a drug problem that led to those situations, if, if your concern is you want the ability to be able to terminate them, the, the answer is absolutely yes. Not only that, if there's reason to believe that that person simply has a drug problem and you can articulate the, the, the suspicion and why you have that suspicion, then you can have that employee drug tested. I think all we're saying is that there's probably some legal danger in saying across the board every employee is going to be randomly drug tested. And, and uh, while, while I agree personally, I, would, I think that's Well, here's the, problem. Right. here's the problem with making it a reasonable suspicion, all right? Reasonable suspicion. If I have a reasonable suspicion that Ken's have, uh, taken drugs, who's going to turn him in? Who's going to be the one that he has to report to? Uh, well, he reports to the board. But I'm not around here every day. How do I know? Is Mary going to turn him in? Heck no, she's not going to turn him in because he's the one that signs her checks. If, yeah. if, it, if it turns out that it's not, you're down the road, dude. lady. You thought I was on drugs. But if you have a, a program set up that everybody on a random basis is going to be checked, either they do one thing, either they find another job or they clean up their act. That's how it happens. If you have nothing to hide, there's no reason to have a problem with being random drug tested. But if I have a problem, I think I'm going to have, make sure that I don't have to have that done. Yeah. Um, I, I'm willing to draft the policy that way. And I know that you guys directed it to be done that way because it seemed rather clear to me that doing that across the board randomly as to every employee exclusive of safety sensitive. I mean, we're just talking about somebody that is in no way involved in anything who, like that. Who, who doesn't, who does not operate a, a company vehicle? That's, that'd be my first question. It's just the ladies in the office? So. That's basically, uh, Aaron and I drive trucks around now and then. Well, I know Aaron drives a razor like a bat out of Vegas. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> uh, and Wes, Wes rarely drives. Yeah, yeah, but I, I think yeah. that the, the definition doesn't just say a company vehicle. It's driving a vehicle, a vehicle on vehicle yeah, pers personal vehicle <laughs> on district business. Yeah. Sometimes that happens. The ladies will go to the bank or they'll pick up something like when we have snacks here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's I think though there's and I'm just deferring to Bo about does it say I can't remember because I read that too. Regularly drives or frequently here. It says, yeah, on a regular and recurring basis. So, again, if, if the board says, look, I mean, you guys know, the only thing I ever care about is that you guys know legally what the issues are. What you guys decide is, is what it's going to be. Um, but, you know, I, I want you to be aware of what the, the legal danger is. Um, so I, what, I, are, what are the ramifications if we adopt that, something to challenge it in court? Or we could test somebody and then they could challenge it and throw the throw the test out or what, well, what are the ramifications? Yeah, I didn't know this issue was going to come up in a in a public meeting and, and there are I mean there's there's potential litigation involved here. So it's it's a delicate situation to answer because I 
the last thing I ever want to do is, is do something or, or have anything said in the meeting that would bring liability on the district. Right. Um, but to go forward knowing that something is problematic and, and, uh, or potentially legally problematic and to go forward, yeah, I think it could bring liability on the district by a challenge of the, of the process. Now, that would have to be somebody who has standing to sue. I wouldn't be so concerned about somebody coming forward before they had actually been drug tested. Um, although I think they could still declare that the policy was unconstitutional or uh, violated the law. My bigger concern would be we start randomly drug testing people that have no relationship to a safety sensitive position or a CDL and and we start doing that on a regular basis, I think an employee could challenge that. And might, I, I think might, they, might it affect any claims we had with pull pack? Yeah, if we if we knowingly break the law, then we don't have coverage from pull pack. Now, pull pack primarily covers us in uh, negligent, like normal insurance and negligence situations, but pull pack actually goes beyond that um, for purposeful, intentional wrongdoing in some cases if an employee does that. but. Um, I my, my legal opinion is that we get absolutely as close to what the district wanted as set forth in that previous meeting without running afoul of, of the law. And I think we can be rather aggressive with that. And I think most of the entities around here have been. As I said, we spoke to a number of them. And they have policies that look like this. Yeah, they're pretty close. <clears throat> but like I said, I think if we define what the the list of positions designed as uh, safety sensitive. I mean, it sounds to me like the only people who might be excluded are the ladies in the front office. Well, but even they could be run to Smith's or something and get donuts. But I think the definition was regular. But, you know, I mean, that, I mean, that's, it probably needs to be defined as anybody that should, not everybody, anybody that does. Operate a vehicle. Let's say it only takes once. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's I agree. I mean, there's other things that the district could do. I mean, you brought up an example of, you know, Mary, you know, suspecting that Ken, the general manager, is is using drugs. I mean, th there can't be retaliation. I mean, let's say that. Right. It, you know some future time, a different general manager, different people, I mean, you can't terminate somebody for something like that. And I realize that at that point it's been done, they've been terminated, and there's some practical implications there, but as a legal matter, you can't do that. The, the district could look at doing things like training on drug testing. I think Pull Pact actually offers some of that. We did it um, just, I put a date down here, it was uh, September 12th. Uh, in this room, we did train for all the supervisors, and it was, it was very effective. And it was less than a year since the previous training, and it involves recognition of aspects. Well, on here's here, you have we had some training, and, and we had an individual that once again assumed we assumed that that was a problem, but we never took care of it. Yeah, we never took care of it. We 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 might have listed it down, but we never took care of it, and that's the problem. Did we know about? That before. My understanding is that Warren we had a thought that, that there was some suspicion there and had written some stuff down, but we never did anything about it. So, so the kind of training that, I mean, this is the way I think most big entities deal with this, is they train their supervisors and all the employees, these are the kinds of things that you look for. And, and I think some of that training can be good and, and it can give you a basis because the the standard is a reasonably articulable set of facts that would lead you to believe that that person may have a drug problem, and, that, and that's very broad. There's no. But he drove. He drove a company car, right? Yeah, he could have been tested if he was on a regular basis. If he was defined in, under the safety sensitive position, he could have been. Uh, could have been tested. And it goes back to if we define it as anybody that does or or in their, their job could drive a company car, I think we only leave three people out of it, four? Five. Five. So. For the people with the highest visibility, it's true. And, um, and that, that was, that's one reason I scheduled the training so soon again, is because I think that it, 
should have been recognized and there should have been a request for, for um, testing. Uh, whereas the behavior was documented, but the suspicion of potential drug use was was not followed up on. Well, one of the problems when you got the, the supervisor is you don't want to be the SOB that turned your partner in. I think that was part of it. You get a little yeah. comrade. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to be the guy. I wonder if you guys could develop something that there's like a, an anonymous kind of thing or something that, you know, I. It's for you guys to decide how that would work, but you guys could, as part of the policy, implement something that would may maybe very clearly say that, look, if you ever suspect that and, and you tell a supervisor or whoever you tell, well, I think there's not going to be, it, it kind of does say that. Says that and, and that's what the law is, but you guys can even take it a step further and say, this is the, this is the procedure you're going to follow in order to make that kind of a report so that you never get into the kind of situation that, that you were concerned about. So. I guess from a legal standpoint, my preference would be to explore those kinds of things as opposed to have a policy which I think on its face would be problematic. We got a big hand up. He's an expert on drugs. Let's listen to Wayne. <laughs> I didn't want to call on him because I'm just sitting there and joined up and smiling. <laughs> Wade, would you? Wade Polson, General Manager, Lincoln County Water District. In a prior life, I had to deal with a lot of these type of issues. Um, the way we dealt with it was we initiated a policy that uh, there was a safety meeting. We did it every month. And every employee was required to have a safety meeting. You can put a time frame, whatever time frame that is. We also required safety contacts. For us, it was once a week. We, my supervisors had to contact their employees who worked for them once a week and have a safety contact. And it could apply to anybody from... Uh, running the, the arsenic plant to driving the truck, make sure you put your seatbelt on, that's a safety contact. If you're working in the office, hey, be careful when you're on a roller chair, it's got, when you roll back, you can slip and fall, you know, when you're picking up a box of paper, use your legs, those are safety contacts. Our frequency was, was that frequent because of the type of work that we did, but you could put time frames to that. Through the safety contact, if there is any suspect of a violation of safety protocol, then that could be written up and formed in and now you have documentation. And then through that, you can aggressively go after it and if it so seems, you can drug test that person. And that's how we tie our drug test back into our safety program. So that if there was a violation of a safety contact, a violation of any of the safety rules, it was an automatic drug test. And it worked all the way from the plant manager down to the packer. And everybody was under the same protocol. Just a suggestion. We have uh, in the policy uh, suggested mandatory uh, drug testing after any automotive collision. All right. Or no fault. That time it might be a little too late. I didn't see anything in there about a workman's comp claim either. Was that in there? A workman's comp claim? Yeah. Like you had some context. kind of claim, like you got hurt on the job? Any kind of claim? Related to drugs? No, no, no. If you file, if you say I got hurt on the job, then the, you have to take the test. Oh, um, <clears throat> no, I think, I think it defines it as if there's um, any accident, be it vehicle or any other kind of accident, then it's mandatory drug test. Workers' comp, I think, could potentially fall into that. I, I mean, I don't know that every single workers' comp claim would necessarily point to a potential drug problem, no, but of certainly course if it not, did... But well, it says, I mean, it says neither, neither will every traffic accident or and uh, under testing conditions, which page, uh, page five, any employee may be required to submit to drug or alcohol testing without requirement a reasonable suspicion for the following reasons. And okay. item four is after an on-the-job accident injury, yeah, or after the last chance condition of employment. So that would cover it. I, I mean, that's, yeah, I, I think that's a safer way to do it than to say all workers' comp claims because there could potentially be a workers' comp claim that... Wasn't an accident? Yeah. 
I mean, the some motion. Yeah, like uh, carpal tunnel. I mean, there's. I think there's other situations where they could be playing. I think carpal tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot. Uh, that's a lot of doing that. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember that. I think that there's more work that needs to be done. At least I would like to see done on this. Like what specifically? Well, I would like to, number one, define those that are in those safety sensitive positions. Okay, like kind of like Rich is saying, let's specifically call out what titles those employees hold, okay? okay? Um, I also... I had some... Um, on the testing procedures, there was some employees' refusal to cooperate in an administration of a correct test or to provide a, okay, that one's okay. There was somewhere in there that talked about a breath test, and I'm thinking, well, not every problem is alcohol-related. It's not going to be brought up in a breath test. So. You mean to, uh, number 2A, use only an uh, evidential breath there? I mean, it does. It does have a, a blood test on there. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, one thing that I saw in another policy, maybe it was the city, also stated that if they were, uh, that they agreed to have any of the results, like if they say the highway patrol pulls them over, that they agree to release those results to the water district. I didn't see that anywhere in this policy. Which yeah, it's probably a good. Yeah, addition. I don't. I don't know. That we have that in here. So law enforcement uh, drug testing would be released to yeah, they, if they, they got stopped in a company vehicle all right. or in, on company time. Because <coughs> well, they're not well, always in a company vehicle. I mean, I mean it's it's company, I think there could be a question once a month of whether or not that would car. be enforceable. Yeah. I think an employee yeah. could potentially challenge the provision that Rich was talking about, but it's not the kind of provision in there that I would say on its face is unconstitutional. I think it's more along the one that maybe an employee could challenge it and say, look, um, this is somewhat unconscionable just because I'm working there, I'm agreeing to, to give results that have nothing to do with my job. But, but I didn't, but, no, I think that was talking about on the job. Okay. They got pulled over and breath analyzed. Oh, they, well, I think they, that might actually be in here if it's on the job. Is it? I think so. I didn't see it. No. Well, Um, okay, so we've got the positions, we've got the release the results to the district. Um, are there other things that you guys want to well, add to this? Well, along those lines, is my concern is that, you know, if we don't put in there something like that, that, you know, we don't use our tester and they're positive according to the state's test or somebody else's test, then they can say, well, I didn't, you didn't test me, so, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, uh, and. Rich, I mean, it's been a little while since I was working on this, but I thought that there was something like that in here. But there might but be. I, not, I, missed, I missed it if it's not, but or if it is. So and if it is I'm not, well, I made a note of it, and we'll, we'll add that to it. There is one section that I wanted to ask you guys about. Wanted to get the board's, you know, ideas on this. It's in section four. What page? On page four. This has to do with whether or not the district wants to, you know, kind of have a program in place that if, a, if a, an employee, I saw this in many, many different yeah, I saw it too. Uh, policies that, I, that, that yeah. I looked at. Or if they feel like they're having trouble, they can come forward. Yeah, and, and I, I had written on here comments like optional, and I, I wrote that in on, on my version here. Um, I don't know what the board's... My personal is opinion is... is, is I'm willing to help out, help people out however they can. If they're willing to come and say I got a problem, then I think mm -hmm. we have a responsibility to try to help them out. Yeah. Now, if we find out after the fact, then my what's the word? Willingness to look away yeah. or deal with yeah. yeah, it goes away. Compassion. Compassion. I don't have that very often, so that's why I don't know that word. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. there's provisions in here where you know if somebody is admitted to a program, they have to basically yeah. test out of it. Right. And then we have, then we would be 
hyper alert about their performance. Now I know with the county, once again I can only stay with the county because that's the only policy that I know, is if you come forward in voluntary treatment, um, you are put on a, a random drug testing after that. Uh, they can not, call you at any time and, yeah. and say... It's not random, it's... it's uh, yeah, it's, it's a... Um, they actually can just come call up and say, up and say yeah, for, uh, we go want, down and get tested. I thought there was something. I was thought there was something in here that I saw that said. And then with that, it also goes along with the last chance. I mean, I think they get one chance. That's the last to fail, yeah. and then they're put on a last chance agreement. The next time they fail, they're kicking a can. That's the, what I was the provision I was thinking of. The last chance. Agreement. Well, that really makes sense though, because we got a lot of money and time invested in employees and. We have to start over again. We got to start over. From well, I, I think it goes yeah. to the fact that you know good idea. anybody's can be in that situation. I don't care who you are, where you're at. I'm sure there's West, a chance you West can be, wouldn't. We no, don't have to worry about. We don't have to worry about West. He's beyond that. But um, if I had West job. Doing some drugs. <laughs> <laughs> <Lots of them>. <laughs> <laughs> West doesn't have to drink this month. <laughs> I hope West stays here with all these films. <laughs> <laughs> he can go home in a few minutes. I'd like to see that uh, those changes made, and maybe have a uh, litigation session that we can discuss all the problems, the potentials, yeah, a see. little more in depth. That's before we make a before we make a. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, it sounds like any motion to approve it would obviously be premature, but. Right. It, uh, yeah, I mean, you can either informally give us a direction to implement the comments that have been made. I think it's been some pretty good comments. I know yeah. you heard them down, so you want to take the stab out of the way it is and, yeah, and then consider maybe, that the direction and then come back with it? Yeah, and we can schedule a maybe a short litigation session maybe talk through some of these good, issues yeah. in a little more detail. Yeah. But I, I didn't see anywhere where it says specifically CDL. I mean, it, everything it, I read was a It incorporates the... Because there's a ver very specific federal law on that. For, yeah, for, yeah. But and so it just incorporates but that. But I mean, in the, in the memo here, of having a policy of random drug and alcohol test for non safety employees, specifically those without a commercial driver's license, is regarded as legally pro problematic. I didn't see that anywhere. What, I mean, what are you reading from? From Ken's memo. Oh, oh. oh. So that, that's what kind of threw me off because they, everybody else is talking about non, non safety employees. Not once did the CDL come up, other than CA, CDL was mentioned because that's there's federal mm -hmm. guidelines for that. It is on page four about CDL. Yeah, I think, right. no, I think what Rich is no, saying, no, it, not, uh, it's, it's in there. It, no. It's in the policy, but um, maybe some of the backup didn't include the safety sensitive stuff, and, and that's in the policy as well. But. We'll get that straightened out. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It threw me out. Okay. I would like to go, if we're going to have a litigation session on this, let's not do it on the 20th of November, because I work that day. I'd like to be in attendance of that. So. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to have a separate session before November 6th, and then put this on the November 6th agenda? Or would you like to have it us do our best shot and then have it ahead of the November 6th one on the same day. And no, let's, let's have our meeting and then put it off for the next meeting. The next yeah. meeting I won't be there. November 6th I'll be here. So we could have the workshop for the litigation session. Yeah, let's not have it on the same day that we're having. Okay. Okay. Do you so want to have it like a week from today? Bit. The litigation. Yeah, the litigation. Yeah, I, I just think there's there were too many things that were we brought up last time that aren't included because of what you're saying as far as possible litigation. And I mean, I still believe that anybody needs to be, if you're going to work, and that that's our, we're providing that service out there that people need to. And so I, I would really like to see the meeting before we have to vote on it and you rewrite something and vote on it because. Yeah. Let's I think everything senseless. that you guys just I, I think everything you guys discussed in the prior meeting is in here except the random drug testing. Let's, I think that's the real issue. Let's do it before the the sixth meeting, a meeting on the sixth. We'll have a litigation to... session before the meeting on the sixth, but not on the agenda for the sixth. <clears throat> okay, postpone it to the following meeting in November. Yeah. Okay. Um 
I don't want to have to come back and do this 15 times. There's no, we don't have to make a motion. Well, yeah, this is an action item, isn't it? We have to table it some, right? But bring it back in December. Well, 20th, I won't be there the 20th, I think. Well, it's possible, actually. We're not going to take action on it. We're not going to do anything. I think we've already given him direction. Direction. Okay, so do I, do I get a litigation session on the 6th before the board meeting? Mm -hmm. And for discussion of this, you give you an hour, or hour and a half, depending on what else comes up. And then uh, then we just decide that that one we want it on the agenda. Then we're ready okay. for it. Well, on. I can, I mean, I oftentimes you send you guys session next like week uh, you want. cases and stuff. Do you want to read some of these Fourth Amendment? I know Rich likes to read those, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I likes know. might be a stretch, but yeah, it, it intrigues me. I will not. Yeah, so, I mean, maybe I'll send some of that stuff to you guys in advance, and that way the litigation meeting will be more productive. And you can put it on the agenda for the 6th, and we can pull it if it's not ready. So that way you don't have to wait another. Yeah, that's fine. I'd go ahead and put it on the agenda. We'll have, go ahead and have the legal session, and then if we can't come to a conclusion, then we don't, right. uh, we pull it out. That, that makes sense. That works. Okay. Here, here. I make a motion with uh, table number nine until the meeting of November 6th. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Five in favor, none opposed. Uh, the motion carried. So we'll move on to the hydrologist report. Where's the hydrologist? I didn't see anything in the pack. Did you fall out? Apologize. Uh, out of town to meet the deadline to, to get the. Hydraulics report in. Um, working here, uh, some things I've been working on is we have monitoring wells that have to wash. And for those that don't know where that is, it's between uh, the Duck Club, which is down the Virgin River, before you get to uh, really where the Muddy River and the Virgin River confluence meet together. Um, that, those, yeah, I guess the permit to have those monitoring wells is up in December. I've been working on uh, getting that extended with the state of Nevada. <coughs> postpone going on the, the uh, rain gauges this is a prior arrangement and we'll be doing that on Friday and then Monday and Tuesday as well um, and then just working on day to day stuff uh, been doing some, some research through old files uh, for different matters for here in the district if a charter issue or uh, permitting anything of that nature I'm spending a bit of time going through old files and we're going to read Organize some of those files possibly to have better access so that being now not sure exactly where that. Any questions for, for me or? I had an idea the other day, and it might be a dumb idea because I have those quite often. About 90% are done. But um, you brought up halfway wash, wash, and that kind of triggered a thought. Um, do you think there would be any benefit to having an easement for us? to and from like me. My thought process being that, you know, if, if, if it ever comes to the point where we need to use this groundwater for, for culinary use, we do like Vegas, pull it out of the lake, pump it back up. You know, once it, what would be difficult if it, once the Virgin River water meets Lake Mead, mm -hmm. becomes it becomes part of the Colorado, Colorado River Compact, right. and we would have to, as SNWA did, they went to legislation and had to change Nevada law, and that required a compact between the lower Colorado River states as well. I mean, it, it would be a huge uh, process. Um, and Lake Mead is so, so many entities already pulling, so many straws going in there already, right. that would be very difficult to, to push. And then you'd have to have the pipeline to push it back up this direction. Right, I mean, I know it'd be costly, but. Now, uh, no, so that's treated. correct. And we got a ton of water. So. And that's true. Once once it reaches Lake Mead, it would dilute the salinity mm -hmm. of the water, and it most likely wouldn't require. I, I don't know exactly. Well, I have looked in the past what the salinity levels is the in the Overton Arm of Lake Mead, and it's still higher than say where uh, Satellite Island is, where um, Las Vegas area pulls right. their water out. Um, that could be looked at if that's something. Like to be uh, kind of fleshed out and looked at more. 
Um, I know internally we had discussed and looked at that uh, a little bit, and just looking at the logistics of it uh, looks kind of daunting. Um, and just the pipeline itself, and then the political aspects that have to be covered. But, yeah. Well, I thought it was about Stonehead, so we'll just hold that one. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Peterson's retirement after 17 and a half years. That was a nice little. Uh, Good Mary cry. Mary was she wasn't even here. <laughs> she left a nice note for uh, Ice cream social. Uh, but had conversations in review with uh, Wes Smith and the auditors. Um, did some work on the Virgin uh, River Watershed Conference, which happened here in town. Uh, several discussions about the fire hydrants and emails with the uh, fire chief. Um, uh, followed up with the uh, DC trip with uh, a general manager's memo on our webpage that referenced uh, the uh, packages that we gave to all the lawmakers. So that's a pretty complete. Uh, Prompted by Barbara's. Chastisement. <laughs> I was going to say castigation. <laughs> castigement. Works. Castigation. Trying to please. I don't know what that word means. I got a big X. We don't have any uh, report yet on the VRHCRP progress. Uh, it's possible this time. Um, Bowen Collins and Associates did complete their master plan draft. Karen and I both looked at it. We've had similar comments, most of them not very very deep, but we think significant enough. We're gonna meet with Mike Chandler on Thursday, do a review, and then we should have that for you um, on November 6th at the board meeting. That's the master plan? That's the master plan uh, revision. So I, I think that was a very wise and valuable piece of work uh, that I'm gonna show you. And I just wanna publicly thank Mary for taking over all Val. Sorry, Mary. Val, while Mary was gone. So um, she did a good job. I'm lucky, I'm lucky to have such supportive staff. Yeah. Uh, any questions for me? No, Molly, I would really appreciate it to give, do some little research into that St. George and their desire for that water, maybe. Okay, that's all my notes. Thank you. In the past, I did do some research on that and called uh, the stadiums. Well, let's see, I guess it would be the chief hydrologist of the state of Utah's water resource. And the way they do their um, permitting is different than the state of Nevada and how they, uh, I guess, catalog it and whatnot. So it wasn't as easy just to get a number and say, okay, there's this many permits allocating this basin. They don't, they don't have set up in a basin type setup. Oh, okay. um, so you, you kind of have to get coordinates. Um, I kind of went the rounds trying to get that information and I was able to go do a search on their website and set it up by myself. But again, that's just uh, a non-verified attempt by me to do that and not by the city of Utah. That's going to stamp it. Yeah, that's how many applications are within uh, basin, the lower version river basin on the Utah side. Um, but that's something Ken and I had talked about, and I know I, I had kind of angst providing that information because I couldn't verify it for the state of Utah. I remember that now. It was a difficult piece of work he had, and they don't work the same in Utah as we do here in Nevada. Aaron, are there, are there records on file, do you think, in Utah that would contain that information? Sure. There are, and I, I think if we pursued it, we could get the city of Utah to... Cause we it's going to take some it. time for them to do it, and that was something... You know, I went back and forth to a couple different guys within their entity to try to get that information and found like we can. It, if you need it, we can push it right now, but it's that's not something. So I, it is something we can get, I, I believe. Um, me going through it at the time, I could see where applications had been made by different entities there, but it was that application it wasn't permitted water. Again, it was just it was paper water saying we'd like this in the future. Again, that doesn't take into account a. Uh, a See a transfer, a basin transfer 
application, which again, dealing with like Snake Valley in Nevada, uh -huh. that's going to be an issue again within our base, and that's something that have to be addressed between the two state engineers. What? But at the same time, just having applications there and waiting. You, know, you think maybe just ask in Washington Water Board? Yeah. That that would probably do that, and that would at least tell us. The, I know their I know their council. We we have a working relationship with uh, their hydrologist Corey Tran. Okay. Um, even their uh, general manager, we've we've Ken and I sat down with both of them in the past. That's something we could you know give them a call and see if that's information they would. Uh, I'm, I'm, well, it's up to you. I'm sure we. Can. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is if any of these entities we don't have a contact that would expedite it. Um, Utah has a fairly aggressive public records request law, like Nevada. So, I mean, there's time frames associated with that. So if if, if we're getting the runaround, if I, and I don't know that we are, but if that ever happened, we could make a public records request. Yeah, I guess I shouldn't, if it came across, I was seeing that the state of Utah is going to be the runaround. And necessarily that they weren't. I mean, it was a process, and going through that process was going to be uh, needed time and, uh, to do that. And so they were willing to do that. They, they expressed that. And uh, it was in the middle of doing our, the Bureau of Reclamation um, application for, for the grant. And so there's a deadline for us to get that information. And by the time that the city of Utah could get that to us, it would have been passed, and so I didn't push for them to continue that. Um, but definitely, of course, we, we can do that. And again, what was brought up, I think we could work with Washington County Water Conservancy District. Um, and some of those, what I looked at online, I could see that they were under some of the cities, which uh, Washington County Water Conservancy District has under kind of an umbrella, kind of like SNWA does. And so maybe they don't have that record. I don't know how that would all be underneath that would work. Uh, but anyways, it, with, with time, we can find all that information out. Okay.